Welcome to the Nerd Stalker Podcast. We are giving you the uh, week's uh, tech news here. I am Adolfo Fronda at, at Nerd Stalker on Twitter, and I'm here with my friend. Anyway. I'm Greg Gloria, aka Social Greg, uh, on Twitter. Hey, how's it going, man? All uh, right, our episode number twenty-six. Twenty-six. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, let's get into it. It, it took only iOS five point one just fifteen days to match the adoption rate of of Android OS. Come, yes. What's about that? Yeah. Man? So this is uh, coming from a gentleman named David Smith, who's a developer in his blog, and um, he has an application um, called uh, Audiobooks. Actually, it's an iOS application. And uh, he's and he develops for for mobile and stuff. And this is a rather mathy type of uh, uh, entry here. So forgive me in <laughs> advance. Uh, yeah. So on what he says is on November tenth of uh, this of two thousand eleven, Apple released the iOS five point zero point one update. Right. This was the first time Apple had made use of an over the air update for iOS, or as they call it OTA. On March seventh, Apple released their second over the air iOS five point one um, update. Right. Uh, this included incremental updates to iOS along with Siri support for, for Japanese. And over-the-air updates are significant for developers because they dramatically increase the pace at which uh, users update their devices. This allows developers to more quickly s- drop support for old versions and more rapidly embrace the new features provided by the latest OS, uh, which is mm. a really big plus for developers. It's huge. Um, this data, is, what he's using here, is taken from the user base of Audiobooks' app. Audiobooks is, is uh, universal, so provides data from both the iPhone and iPad. Uh, the okay. free and paid versions of Audiobooks together get around 100,000 weekly downloads, so provides to, uh, statistically meaningful data set, is, is what he's saying. The iPad 3 launched on uh, February, of uh, March 16th here. And uh, the developer was expecting a huge swell in 5.1 adoption given all the new devices. Uh, From what he saw in the data, it looks more like a minor bump in adoption dwarfed by the overall rate, right, of iOS. It took iOS just 15 days, as we mentioned before, to get the same percentage of users on the latest OS version as currently on any single version of Android. Uh, According to Google's platform version site, the most widely used Android version is API level 10, or otherwise known as Gingerbread, which currently has 61.5% of users. Uh, This was released Hmm. in mid-2011. Looking uh, looking just at the -the over-the-air eligible users, we see a promising future for iOS developers. Nearly 80% of users are on the latest version within 15 days. It would be easy to point the finger at Android and remark how different this picture, uh, 38% of users running the latest iOS version in five days, is to the fragmentation we see on Android devices. True. That isn't really constructive since the amazing upgrade pace we see above or in these charts is a result of users being given the opportunity to upgrade and then acting on it. Most users Mm -hmm. of Android simply don't have the opportunity. While that doesn't make things any better for the poor developers who try to to support the various flavors of Android, it isn't really an apples-to-apples comparison. However, it does reinforce his near-complete focus on developing for Apple's platform. So another, you know, reason to develop solely for for iOS, it seems like here. Hmm. So, Greg, what do you think of uh, this next story? It's very interesting because there's a lot of elements to this. New Facebook, Interpretation for Brands. Yes, uh, that's from my uh, one of my Twitter followers, Social Steve on Twitter. As you know, on uh, March 30th, brands have to, are going to the new timeline uh, for Facebook. And we don't talk much about – we talk about Facebook as a company a lot of times on this show, but we don't talk about Facebook as an app too much because you know, it's pretty widely adopted and a lot of stuff yeah, out right. there. But um, – but, you know, it's worth mentioning this week, right, for brands at least, uh, there'll be a new cover photo just like your own personal um, uh, timeline. Uh, fan engagement is separated and not um, integrated uh, with the brand's posting as shown on the timeline. So that's going to be kind of a little bit different. Um, uh, splash pages like Gates are no longer an optional uh landing page and uh, you have some admin control uh, on look and display of posts which were kind of important I, I do a lot of um, Facebook uh, management for some of our clients and and I always thought that it needed a little bit more admin control so um, you know page admins now could uh, pin pictures to the top there which is a little bit different than our um, than our other personal pages right yeah. um, uh, there's also a reach generator um, and we'll talk about that a little later which is kind of a you know uh, moves uh, Facebook into this freemium model which we'll talk about later um, you know there's premium ad formats um, 
you know, sponsor stories, page posts, and then um, offers, um, you know, postings of discounts or promotional uh, uh, promotions from band, brands to the fans. So, you know, Facebook now is is, is causing, um, you know, maybe maybe it's a la Google Plus, but you know, they're they're making brands becoming a destination site. Almost, you know, there was this debate I think a few years ago that, you know. Why do brands need a web page when they have a Facebook page now? Now yeah. you kind of wonder about that, right? Right. And um, you know the ability to kind of manage, um, you know, your destination site with new content that people could come and see. So, so the Steve, uh, Social Steve, is really saying that right now, Facebook is not really a community site anymore for brands, but actually a brand destination site, which mm. is kind of an interesting twist to it right because mm -hmm. one of his arguments i thought was really kind of valid um mm -hmm. is that if you're really going to use facebook as a brand's community um you would have access to all its data as as a marketer right mm -hmm. well it, it turns out with the likes you have all the likes but you really don't have their data mm -hmm. um so you really can't take advantage of it right so mm -hmm. he's he's making the argument that it really is a destination spot and 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 the next part is that he really talks about the freemium model because um uh, one thing interesting he said in his post that that um that only 60% of fans saw brands posts yeah. um which which is interesting because it it's really kind of due to this edge ranking algorithm that F uh, facebook has he says yeah, and and now what happens to to bump those posts into those people's uh timeline mm -hmm. you know they now offer this thing called a reach generator yeah. which ups the view percentage on your new on the news feed to about a guaranteed 75% as wow. high as 95 wow yeah but you have to pay for it so uh, it's basically um, it's kind of like maybe thirty cents per like for a three month period, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you wow. know. And, and it's funny because like I just got a client this week that asked me, "Can I go from my thirteen thousand to fifty thousand?" I go <laughs> in a month. I go, wow. It's gonna cost. You. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's gonna cost you. <laughs> but well, there was some other news you were telling me about just earlier. Oh, that's right. Um, uh, another f interesting aspect of Facebook, touching on Facebook, is, uh, you know, we've been hearing lately about uh, prospective employees applying for jobs and, and mm -hmm. prospective mm -hmm. employers uh, asking for those those candidates' password to get into yes. their Facebook accounts and to, yes. I guess, look into it. And we've been warned before oh by, by others that this is possible, you know, obviously if you give your Facebook to someone. But allegedly, from what I've been reading, and I just know highlights here, is that Facebook has... Mm. To, Recently, this is recent news um, has threatened to possibly look into legal action against um, prospective employers doing this to candidates, to job candidates. Mm, uh, mm, and I, I think there's some now there's some sort of governmental interest, or, or they're approaching the government about uh, looking into this kind of uh, behavior by companies, uh, also, which is I think a, a probably a positive step. But we'll see. Right. Who knows? All right. No, I, th that's really good because I think in another week or two I'm, I'm going to be doing a um, social media for job hunting um, hmm. seminar down cool. at uh, Cal Poly, and cool. and uh, you know I I, I, like, I like to touch on that because I think that there's a lot of data out there that a lot of recruiters are using Facebook for you know doing screening of, of, of potential candidates. Yeah. Let's move move into the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, amid privacy concerns, Apple has started rejecting apps that access UDIDs. Yeah, yeah, I know. This is I go from the math heavy story to now this super deep oh my tech God, you're like so... UDIDs. <laughs> like everyone knows what those are. Oh my God. So yeah, yeah. anyways, thanks to Kai May Cutler from TechCrunch for this story. Yeah. So, as you mentioned, uh, amid uh, extra scrutiny from Congress around privacy issues, Apple this week has started rejecting apps that access UDIDs or identification numbers that are unique to every iPhone and iPad. Uh, for those uh, unaware, the UDID is an alphanumeric string that is unique to each Apple device. It's currently used by mobile ad networks, game networks, analytic providers, developers, and app testing systems. Two of the ten review teams started doing blanket rejections, this is at Apple, of apps mm -hmm. that uh, access UDIDs this week. Uh, next week that will rise to the four, uh, to four, then um, the ten teams, and keep escalating until all ten teams are turning down apps. 
uh, that are still using UDIDs. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal because mobile ad networks use these ID numbers to make their advertising better targeted. Got Using it. UDIDs, uh, mobile ad networks can track consumers from app to app to understand more about ads they respond to and apps they use most often. At the same time, however, they are uh, there are very real privacy risks tied to the widespread use of UDIDs. Uh, they're more sensitive than cookies on the web because they they can't be cleared or deleted. Uh, they're more sense um, and they're tied to the most personal of devices, the phones we carry with us everywhere. Apple has been facing pressure from lawmakers in this last week about how apps can share consumer data without their knowledge. Others are seeing a few developers get through the approval process if they ask users for permission first before storing their UDIDs. Uh, if so, this mirrors the approach that Facebook and Google Android take in making developers show permissions dialog to consumers when they first install the app. Uh, however, some are not sure that this is a good user experience or that good uh, or or that enough consumers will say yes to make the strategy effective. Some just don't. Some just don't think that the opt-in rate will be that high, uh, and a lot of them think that it's just a band-aid solution for now. So, wow. wow! 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 So this is really this is really huge because this is all very last minute, and now developers and companies, I should say, are scrambling to to find an alternative approach, another solution. There's been open source sort of mentions. Heck yeah. Uh, to to solve to address this issue, um, so this is really this is really big news. And speaking of Apple, Apple, Amazon, Google, or Comcast, who's going to win TV 2.0? Well, you, you know, the, Greg has the, the answer. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got some of the answer. Uh, well, Apple TV was um, you know kind of launched right, and um, yeah, uh, Steve Rosenbaum. Uh, uh, who's kind of like a runs a uh, curated uh, video aggregation platform called Magnify.net uh, was interviewed um, uh, by Bob Garfield on Ad Age. Uh, I, that's a kind of a oh, cool. advertising yeah. uh, mag, right? Uh, yeah, web app, yeah, yeah. So um, you know they were discussing or debating about uh, what the future is for a TV, hmm. and um, especially when you have Google TV coming online, Apple. Um, and then you have other players as well, right? Oh, yeah. And 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 there, his argument was that you know the future won't hinge on, you know, on content or unlimited supply or unlimited supply is a given. It'll hinge on the discovery of content and the the ability to curate it. And I I, I totally agree with that. I mean, if you look at at, at uh, YouTube, you know how many things are on there, right? Sure. And the problem is, even even after you put your search result in there, it still is maybe could be yielding like on Google search, you know, millions of yeah. hits, right? Yeah, sure. And 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 how do you do that? So, you know, Steve Rosenbaum said that you know the future of TV is crystal clear. Um, his take on this was that uh, you know the popular assumption is that TV will always be what TV is today. A whole bunch of noisy cable cable channels and a variety of movies. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's a tons of data that says there isn't a whole new there isn't what a whole new generation of viewers is watching. Um, is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, take for example, Ted. Ted yeah. creates videos that are about 15 to 18 minutes long, right. kind of serious. You know, pretty darn smart actually, right? Mm -hmm. So TV execs would say that it's exactly the kind of stuff that TV viewers would not would run from, right? right. But the data says otherwise, right? Mm. I mean, TED Talks have been viewed by more than more than 700 million times. That's 700 million times, yeah. right? And and so wow. that's relevant in my mind, right? I mean, it may not be viewed in a time slice that a TV show is, but it's viewed over a long period of time, sure. right? Sure, yeah, that's a great right. point. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I, I think we... What he was saying is that, you know, you have companies like Google through YouTube and Google TV, Amazon, Netflix, Apple, and, and, and Comcast. So app, YouTube, as he said, has to do a better job of getting something that's relevant and searchable. Yeah. And, 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 and I think the CEO, um, what Salar Kamangars, uh, kind of said that, you know, we really need to turn maybe YouTube into really viable channels, possibly. Yikes. You know, channelize it, right? Wow. Channelize it, wow. So I thought about that, and 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 if they channelize it, they th what they're really trying to say is that I want to get a relevant brand to create a channel. So 
Mm. I was thinking maybe this is a way magazines and print could go really to get out of their doldrums and really go and create a, a video channel for themselves mm-hmm. where they could where people could find their content somehow yeah. Yeah. um so that was just kind of something i thought but but you know it's a really good thought piece because he was talking about kind of like you know the the where each one of those players have their strengths and weaknesses and how are they going to really vie for this big pie eventually you know in the future you know with 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 apple they have devices that capture content, right? Yeah. Uh, with with Google, they have the content. <laughs> yeah. You know, with Amazon, they have an interesting way of getting at content. If mm-hmm. you think about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Comcast, they own the pipes. He's say, he was saying uh-huh. he, they're the utility company, right? Right. Uh, and they have high end content uh, with NBC Universal, right? So, mm-hmm. so he was just saying that you know it, it's unclear right now but whoever could really figure out this curation game mm-hmm. will make, possibly win, win it all and mm-hmm. and i think you see each one of those companies doing little deals in there to to do that so anyway let's move on um the next uh, one was interesting blip sheds partners no money and smart tv they say yeah yeah so kind of touching on on your story here and this is sort of what i've been mm. saying too is that <laughs> when when i was on the uh carlos rondella show with uh harmony and some people i was sort of the bearer of bad news and, and everyone was like mm. all hopeful in their monetization of their videos i'm like hey me and greg do this for free we're not gonna make any money for this thing <laughs> until we're long dead <laughs> yeah. and our kids are making money on, on this kind of thing or something. may and maybe <laughs> yeah and maybe <laughs> So yeah, so thanks to Giga Omjenko Rochers uh, for this story about uh, Blip. Blip has been quietly ditching a good chunk of their distribution partners, including a number of smart TV platforms. Blip severed ties wow. with Boxy, Popbox, Samsung, and Vizio at the end of February, and will stop distributing videos, distributing its videos uh, to TiVo, DivX TV, and Sony what? on April. What? The company wasn't able for com- uh, wasn't available for comment when contact for the article. But uh, comments made to Blip's own web series producers uh, made it clear that there simply was no money to be made in any of these smart TV platforms. Uh, Blip used to com- used to compete squarely with YouTube as a host for all kinds of videos, but the site relaunched last year with a focus on serialized web content. Uh, a big part of that shift uh, was a commitment to distribute and monetize shows across a multitude of platforms. Blip's site still lists 20 distribution partners, but come last May, less than half of these original partners uh, will be left, well, but come May, actually. Uh, a big part of this was Blips wasn't able to successfully monetize its videos on most of the smart TV platforms it, it is leaving. But even some of the partners that did run against uh, run ads against Blips videos apparently didn't provide enough of a return to warrant for Blip to stick around. Oh. Oh the site gosh. will also stop, stop distributing videos to Vimeo. Uh, but will keep YouTube and Google TV as distribution partners. Also, still, part of Blip's distribution network are iTunes and Roku. Uh, The company started a new monetized partnership with AOL just this week and has said uh, said it may add a few additional distribution distribution partners in the future, which I doubt. Uh, But Blip's move could also foreshadow a bigger (laughs) trend. Dedicated set-top boxes for online video still have a relatively wow. small user base some of the bigger right. cd makers may ship millions of units but that doesn't mean that tv viewers are actually engaging with their platforms save for the occasional use of the embedded netflix app with that smart tv platform makers are caught in a bit of a bind without content users won't tune in and without viewers content providers don't see enough value in their platforms so, oh no! Bit of a catch twenty two oh, here. No. And you know, yeah. as we we used to distribute, well, we do distribute videos to Blip also. Um, we used to have much more of a presence there, but then yeah, they changed their sort of model into this like ep- episodic type of thing. They they changed the whole thing, and they seem to be sort of waning at that point. It kind of felt like, and and we're seeing the mm. clear front runners or really front runner is YouTube in in terms of hosting all this video. Uh, Absolutely. In terms of distribution devices, it's without a doubt. It's like a, it's it's uh, iTunes, right? Um, yeah. Is is yeah. it? It seems like it's iTunes, and, and Roku seems to be like a distant, distant second place, maybe, or something like that in terms of device, mm. maybe. Right. Mm. Speed round. <laughs> All right. Speed, speed round. round. <laughs> cool. You like cool. that sound effect? <laughs> I like that. I like that. I could do that too. All right, Greg. Anyway. Take the post. Yes. 
all right, man, I got the pole position. Yeah. Anyway, Twitter. Happy birthday, Twitter. Happy birthday. Um, uh, all things digital on Friday, as well as uh, today, uh, Huffington Post uh, posted an article about uh, Twitter's sixth birthday and nice. where they came and uh, where they are right now, okay. and it's really kind of cool. You know, I mean, they, they brought us some interesting facts, like, you know, it took, um, you know, three years, two months to reach their one billion tweet. It wow. took 18 months to hit the first 500,000 users and guess where they are today, right? I mean, yeah. 532 million registered users in February, um, you know, uh, 23.6 million unique visits per month. I, uh, I mean, we're excited if we get a thousand uniques, yeah, right? Totally. <laughs> yeah, celebration. You know. And then uh, I think we announced last uh, last month on one of the podcasts that Lady Gaga um, has a massive following of 21 million users. So Oof, I mean, man. go figure it out. That's but amazing. yeah, check out check out the Huffington Post uh, article we're going to put on our backstories as well as on on the on the site in the article. And there's also check out the uh, blog from Twitter. They have a lot of interesting uh, statistics there as well. Very okay, cool. man. So next one is an app called. Pair and thanks to Eric Eldon of TechCrunch yeah, yeah. for this one. Pair is packed with features uh, you see in private social networks like Path, uh, but, but designed for two people. Uh, the interface uh, starts out deceptively simple. You start by taking out taking a photo of yourself and then shooting a quick video uh, on your phone, iOS only for now. Sorry, folks, uh, that you send with the invite to your significant other. So it's intended sort of for a significant other kind of thing. Once they pair you, with you, uh, you'll put into the app. So you get put into the app together. The interface is organized like text, like text messages. You appear on the left side, your partner on the right, but you get an impress, uh, impressive range of options for how to stay in touch. Uh, there's a simple messaging, videos, and photos. Uh, simple, you can touch them up with Camera Plus. But there's also a Thinking of You button, which is a simple notification that's most similar to Facebook's classic poke. And there's a draw feature, mm. so you can scribble all the silly pictures and sweet little ditties that you want. <laughs> nice. Uh, a button on the top nice. lets you turn on FaceTime with a single swipe, which is very interesting. A feature called Thumb Kissing shows your partner's thumbprints uh, wherever they're touching the screen. And uh, both phones will vibrate if your thumbs are on the same place. You can also create share to-do lists and set reminders for birthdays and anniversary. A moment section contains all of your shared photos. So if uh, you guys are into that thing, uh, pair might be for you and your uh, your loved one. Please. Um, Google Voice via Mel, part of Android's phone app. So on uh, last awesome. Thursday, Google Voice on Android 4.0 devices gained a new feature, um, allowing users to uh, listen to their Google Voicemail directly in the native phone app. So cool. basically the voicemails will, will be listed as part of the phone's call log, just like a standard carrier's voicemail, so it's kind of cool. Microsoft Next censors one. Pirate Bay Links in Windows Live Messenger. So if I, as if I didn't have a reason not to use Microsoft Live Messenger, thank you for this additional reason. The Pirate Bay is not the <laughs> most visited BitTorrent site on the internet, but arguably the most censored too. Many ISPs have been ordered to block their customers' access to the website, and recently Microsoft joined in on the action by stopping people's sharing um, of your location with others. Uh, Microsoft's Windows Live Messenger now refuses to pass on links to the Pirate Bay website, claiming they are unsafe. So uh, you can't take care of yourself, Whoa. people. Uh, you know, Big Brother is doing it for you. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> she gets anyway, us right into tip time. Tip time. Tip time. Tip time. <laughs> yeah. Tip time. I like that. I always like saying that. So <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to do a Drippler tip of the week here. So cool. I, I, as as you get your new uh, iPad, and I'm not going to say three, but it's uh, the new iPad. Yeah, you go. Um, as opposed to iPad 1 Proper. or 2, um, you'll need to figure out how to transfer your data, just like a laptop. You get a new laptop, you need to transfer the data. Well, um, one of the Drippler tips this week that we'll have on our links shows you how to use both iCloud and the standard uh, you know, uh, standard way of using iTunes. And um, cool. they go through it step by step for you, and it, it's very easy. You know, you don't have to use a memory stick like you, <laughs> like, like stupid me does with uh, with some laptops sometimes. That's awesome. So, um, I think uh, check out that tip in our um, in our um, backstories as well as the web web article, and uh, you know, I think uh, you guys will be much Great happier. Tip. Yeah, 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 tip, yeah. What's yours, man? So yes, so I am happy to announce uh, this tip. Uh, uh, tip uh, XBMC version eleven, Eden. 
it's called Eden, has just been released. So a year into the making, uh, XBMC, if you don't know, is X stands for Xbox Media Center. It's a media center, an open source media center solution for multiple operating system, which is fantastic. It's similar to something like a a Plex or a Front Row or type of experience. Oh, interesting. Um, it's interesting. really it's really great. Um, so over a year in development, XBMC 11 released today. Milestones include add-on rollbacks. Uh, improvements in the default skin confluence so you can also add use multiple skins on it which make it really cool uh great sp nice. speed increases movie set scraping better protocol handling they now have airplay support which is fantastic and um they finally released the xbmc ubuntu final uh which is the ubuntu version of xbmc so if you guys oh, don't nice. know xbmc now is supports uh, ios apple windows uh linux here and ubuntu is one of the Final variants of this uh, this rev. So check it out. It's free. So download it and uh, give it a go. You know, and uh, might be a good media center uh, solution for you. Wow, great tip, man. That was cool. Yeah, that was fun. good. So what do we got coming up? Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, we got SF New Tech on. Uh, well, we just finished one this week, yeah, but we have so one coming wonderful. up on four eleven. Cool. And what's what's the four one one? So anyway, nice. uh, we'll have that, and then at the end of the month, we'll have the fourth SF New Tech Japan Night, uh, which my company will be uh, co-sponsoring with SF New Tech. That's always fun. Right and uh, we're going to have our semifinals, which kind of takes about 20 or so people down to the final six for the SF New Tech Japan Night at the end of April. So um, that'll be happening in Tokyo at on March 30th uh, wow. at the end of this week. So uh, we can look for that. So. And then also we have a um, uh, our own uh, kind of business uh, dojo event uh, in partnership with Global Bridge HR. Um, we'll have the uh, speaker of uh, the the owner of Yoshi's nightclub uh, will speak at the monthly's event, uh, Yoshi Akuba, and then she'll go into some of the issues uh, facing Japanese entrepreneurs, at least uh, you know, from her standpoint. So Excellent. anyway, it'll be fun and. Uh, Talk about your your event yeah, on May 10th. So, yeah, May 10th. We're, uh, we're contributing to a uh, benefit here for a local public school that really needs it called Daniel Webster. It's called Taste of Potrero. So check them mm. out at tasteofpotrero.com. Uh, there's going to be a lot of fantastic uh, – it's a very h nice high-end type of auction, uh, tasting, food tasting, wine tasting type of event. There will be a lot of giveaways and nice. things like that. Super cool. Very affordable to get in. You, tickets are available now. It's uh, May 10th and tasteofpotrero.com. That's T A E S T E O F P O T R E R O.com. And I'll have the URL somewhere down here, too. Can you repeat that? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> so, May 10th, check it out, you guys. All right, and don't forget to, uh, if you want to contribute to uh, any stories uh, to Nerd Stalker, please use the hashtag N R D S T K. And uh, check us out at nerdstalker.com. Our you know, videos and audio are there as well. Or uh, even better, why don't you just subscribe to us on iTunes, uh, audio or video podcast, and then give us a five-star yes. rating. That'd be great, and uh, that'd help us a lot. Or you can just check us out on YouTube in your Lean Back experience at home on your XBMC or something like that, right? <laughs> just do a search for Nerdstalker <laughs> TV, and then just, or just go and subscribe to our channel there also, and you can just watch us to your heart's content. So I am uh, Adolfo at uh, Gmail, uh, Adolfo at Nerdstalker.com if you want to email me. Yeah. On Twitter, please find me at Nerdstalker. And Greg, how do we get a hold of you? Well, you can reach me on Twitter at SocialGreg, or you can reach me at uh, Nerdstalker.com at SocialGreg at Nerdstalker.com, and I'll answer any of your emails. And uh, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. So, anyway, hey. thanks. Great show, man. Great As week. always. All right. See you guys next yeah. week. Mama me mama, Greg is the littlest guy. I stomp on him like an <laughs> yeah. ant, and I'm the leader. I'm number one. I crush his head. <laughs> there we go. Now more. That always warms me up.